All right, we're ready now to start looking more carefully at that sampling process. Let me, let me remind you where we left off. We're going to take a continuous signal, um, f of x over here, and we're going to multiply it by a uh, impulse train that has a value of 1 at integer multiples of some sampling frequency, t, let's call it. And that's going to give rise to f sub s. Notice, by the way, everything here is continuous. I haven't actually done any real sampling yet in terms of creating a discrete signal. So this thing right here is all in the continuous domain. Everything's rounded brackets. Here's that link I promised you um, with Fourier and convolution. In the, let's call it the space domain or the time domain, we are multiplying two images, two signals. And that is equivalent to, con to convolving their Fourier transforms. So here in the second equation, the capital letter corresponds to the Fourier transform of the uh, sampled signal, of the original continuous signal, and of the impulse train. Of course, this is a continuous Fourier transform, not the discrete one, but everything still works between the, the, whether you're in the discrete or in the continuous domain. By the way, why is it that um, multiplication is uh, convolution? Um, this is actually relatively easy to derive, and if you want to do this as an exercise, I encourage you to do this because it's a good exercise in manipulating these Fourier transforms, but it's actually relatively easy to derive that equation right there. Multiplication in the space domain or time domain is convolution in the Fourier. Oh, and by the way, the reverse is true. If you convolve something in the space or time domain, it's the same as multiplying their Fourier transforms. And that duality between convolution and Fourier turns out to be very convenient and very powerful because sometimes it's easier to reason about things in the space or time domain, and sometimes it's easier to reason about them in the Fourier domain, and we can move between them. So let's see what this means having the, uh, the, the fact that we're going to convolve the Fourier transform of our continuous signal with the Fourier transform of our impulse. So what does it mean? And by the way, why do I care about what it means? Well, I'm sampling a signal. I haven't quite gone down to uh, discrete yet, but I have thrown away a lot of information because when I multiply by that impulse train, I'm throwing away all the samples I don't care about. I'm setting them to zero, and I'm eventually going to throw them away. And I just want to understand what information, if any, I'm losing. Surely we can agree that if you sample something in time or in space, you're throwing away information. And the question is, well, how much? What have I lost? What are the consequences of that? All right, let's find out. So um, this is just a cartoon rendering of the Fourier transform of my original signal. F is the original signal, S is the impulse train, F sub S is the continuous sampled signal. So that's just some whatever, I don't care, it's just some representation. I've just drawn it as a simple uh, a triangle here just for simplicity, but it could be any shape. And in particular, notice that this axis is omega frequency, the DC term is in the middle, that's the, the lowest frequency, and the frequencies um, get increasingly higher, and of course, this Fourier transform is periodic around the origin. Now, the Fourier, what's, so that's, the, that's just some representation of the Fourier transform of the signal. What is the Fourier transform of the impulse train? Turns out it's an impulse train itself right here, um, um, but the space between them is inversely proportional to the space between the impulses in the space domain. So if I sample very finely, well then the gap between these impulses and the Fourier transform get bigger and vice versa. And you'll see that's going to turn out to be very important in a minute. So it's also an impulse train. Also, by the way, you can derive this, but I'm not going to. You can actually compute the, the Fourier transform either numerically or algebraically, and you'll see that it remains an impulse train. And I'm going to uh, just define the spacing in now Fourier as, as omega s instead of t. Now. Let's convolve these two signals here. Yeah, so I've got one signal here, one signal here, and how do I convolve? Well, I take one and I slide it over the other computing inner products. Mm, do, 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 do. That's what I'm showing you down below here. Okay? And what happens here is notice that the gap between these impulses is not very wide relative to the gap between here. And so when I convolve the two together, 
um, I get this weird superposition of this Fourier energy. Yep, and I've drawn that here with the dotted line. So you can see each one of these little peaks here corresponds to a peak over here. And so as I'm sliding this thing over here, the Fourier transform of the signal through some, 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 I'm creating these ghosts of it. And so the Fourier transform of this is pretty ugly. Yeah, it's like this weird thing. And it looks like something has gone wrong. Okay, I mean, in terms of what? I've got this signal up here, and it has that Fourier energy, which means that's what information is in the signal. And now when I've sampled it, this is the Fourier energy, which looks different, which means I've done something to the underlying signal, which may not be desirable. All right, let's look at another example here. So here what I've done is notice that, oops, I'm over here now. But here's what I've done is that the sampling here is wider. How did that happen? Remember, this is all in the Fourier domain. So the, the way I make these go wider is I sample more finely. So there's an inverse relationship between this omega s and the sampling density t. As I reduce t, these things spread out. Okay? Now what's going to happen when I convolve this signal with this signal here, ah, something really interesting happens down here. Why? Well, look at the, the spacing between those impulses. They're actually pretty wide. In fact, they're wider than the underlying Fourier magnitude. And so when I convolve, I seem to get my original Fourier magnitude back with just these repeated copies over and over again. And now it looks like here, maybe I didn't lose information. I mean, something happened. I have these sort of weird repeating copies. I'll deal with that later. But it seems like I have some integrity between the original Fourier magnitude and this, as opposed to here, I don't have integrity. I've lost some information between the original and the sample. Now let's imagine another scenario. Imagine a scenario where the Fourier energy is actually really compact. What does that mean? Well, there's not a lot of high frequencies. It's mostly a slow changing signal. And let's go back to our original sampling lattice that you saw over here. Well, now when I convolve this signal with this signal, I get what? Some integrity. I've got my original Fourier magnitude back over here with these repeating copies because I've done this convolution. And so you can see that depending on the Fourier energy in the original signal, depending on the sampling density, we may or may not have fidelity in our um, uh, sampled signal, all still in the continuous domain. All right, so this gives rise to an incredibly important term and concept in signal and image processing, which is called spatial or temporal aliasing. Aliasing, and you've all seen this, by the way. I'm wearing a solid shirt, uh, but if I was wearing, for example, a, a shirt with a high frequency pattern, like stripes or dots, every time I moved, you would see my, my shirt jiggle a little bit. This is why, by the way, when they tell you to come in the studio, they will tell you to wear solid colors because those patterns, when they get sampled on that digital camera that I'm staring at right here, create these types of aliasing artifacts that you see right here below, because the frequency in the pattern is too high and, the sampling, and or the sampling rate is too low. So over here, if the, uh, the pattern doesn't have high frequency, then we don't get aliasing. Over here, if the sampling rate is really high, so the camera is super high resolution, HD and plus, we don't get aliasing. And over here, if one or both of those are not true, you get aliasing. And, and the thing with aliasing, it's not just visually annoying. It's not just that you're gonna see things moving on my shirt. You're recording incorrect information. And because we're trying to build computer vision systems, that's a really deadly problem. And it's gonna get even worse, by the way, even when we get into the discrete domain. The problem isn't just over here in the continuous. It actually, we'll see in a little bit that the problem can persist in the discrete domain as you're, as you're changing resolution of images. And so the term you wanna know about is the so-called Nyquist limit. What determines if you have aliasing in your image or your signal is if the highest frequency omega n, um, uh, well, let's do it this way, if omega s, which is the frequency associated with the sampling rate, is greater than twice the highest frequency in your signal, then we are said to have met the Nyquist limit. 
And the Nyquist limit says you will not have aliasing. And in fact, it says even something even more amazing, which is that if you respect Nyquist limit, sample at a high enough rate, not only will you not have aliasing, you will have a perfect representation of your signal. You will not have lost any information. That is, I can go from a continuous representation to a discrete representation, and I haven't lost any information. That is sort of amazing, because it doesn't seem like it should work that way. But from this picture, we can see, in fact, that it does. Um, now, there's this one weird thing here, which is that we have these repeated copies. Yeah. So this is my Fourier magnitude of my original uh, continuous signal. This is the Fourier of the impulse train. And this is the result of convolving the two, which is because I multiplied these two to sample the signal. And then I get this, I've respected Nyquist here. I've, I've, I have re these repeated copies. Yeah. Now, that seems sort of weird. I just want one of those, right? Because that's my Fourier energy right here. And I don't want all these, I just want the one. And so the way I can go backwards in this process is to multiply in the Fourier domain by a so-called box filter, which is this yellow dashed line here that says, give me, so the value of that dashed line is one, where the Fourier magnitude is what I want, and zero everywhere else. So think of it as just blocking everything out that you don't want and holding on to this uh, value here. By the way, I'm all entirely in the continuous domain here. So this is mainly a thought exercise. But notice that if I can multiply by this in the Fourier domain, I get back to this, and I've gone through this process and back up, and I haven't lost any information because I've respected Nyquist. That's amazing. Well, how do I multiply by this? Well, I can take the Fourier transform and multiply by this and then inverse Fourier transform. Um, or because multiplication in the Fourier domain is convolution in the space or temporal domain, I can convolve with the inverse Fourier transform of that box filter, which is this guy right here, the so-called ideal sink filter. Here again, we see this nice relationship between Fourier and magnitude. Multiplication in the space domain is convolution in the Fourier. Uh, multiplication in Fourier is convolution in space. So if I inverse Fourier transform that, I get that filter. And if I convolve my original signal, continuous signal with this, I will have gone back to this and gotten back to where I want. Now in 2D, this all works exactly the same thing. I'm not going to go through all the math and all those pictures because they're exactly the same, but I have to do everything in 2D. But the basic idea is you have a, a 2D image, f of x, y, continuous. You have a 2D sampling lattice, which is, again, the impulses shifted across your sampling lattice. And that gives you f sub s, your continuous but sampled signal. That's the same as multiplying by, sorry, convolving in the Fourier domain by the, 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 the Fourier transform of the impulse train and the Fourier transform of the signal. And then that, the, that inverse process is looks something like this. This is the 2D ideal sync. And we're never going to use these things, by the way, because this is all playing in the Fourier domain, in the continuous domain, which we're not going to do. But we need to understand these concepts because what we're really going to care about, I care about this, don't get me wrong, I care about the fact that if I don't sample my continuous image, my continuous audio, my continuous whatever, at the proper rate, then I'm going to have aliasing, which means I'm going to have a, 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 a artifacts in my underlying image or signal that are not a true representation of the world. But it turns out it gets even worse than that, because when you take an image, say, of 1,000 by 1,000, and reduce it to 500 by 500 or 250 by 250, which we do all the time, this exact process that we just went through, continuous to discrete sampling, shows up all over again. And we need to understand that aliasing issue, not just from continuous to discrete, but from discrete to discrete.